On April 19, 1861, the 6th Massachusetts Volunteer Militia, responding to the attack on Fort Sumter, reached Baltimore by train. With the tracks blocked by Confederate sympathizers, the soldiers disembarked into a restless crowd. In the riot that ensued, four Massachusetts men were killed. Please join me in welcoming Park Ranger Dan Gagnon as he discusses the Massachusetts men who echoed the spirit of their Minuteman forefathers. Thanks. Well, first off, I want to thank you for, uh, for coming today um, to, to share my passion. I'm a, a, obviously a, a, a fanatic when it comes to history. And um, my interest in this particular subject comes out of some research that I'm doing in my hometown of those who served in the Civil War. And um, the uniform that I'm wearing today is a, a uniform of the 6th Massachusetts. It's very colorful. It's not the type of uniform you'd think you see um, in, in, for the Civil War. Usually it's much more bland, light blue pants and the jackets. Uh, because early in the war, they had each company had a different type of uniform. It was like a club, so they wore a different uniform. I'm portraying the 6th Massachusetts, Company I of the 6th Massachusetts, and they were based out of Lawrence, Massachusetts. So um, if, if you were to come to some of the Boston or Lowell companies, they may be dressed very differently. Some of them actually in gray uniforms, which caused some confusion later on. Uh, they had to go to the, the, the uniform. So I just wanted to point that out ahead of time. I'm Company I, 6th Massachusetts Militia, okay? Um, it was no accident that Massachusetts was involved. Um, it was uh, it, 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 for the first to respond uh, to the crisis as, um, as the president is calling for troops. They had a vested interest in what was happening here. These, um, the men who served in the 6th Massachusetts, many of them, their grandfathers had served in the previous wars, uh, the Revolutionary War or even the War of 1812. They had struggled to, in the formation of our nation, and these guys are responding to, um, to preserve that nation that, that their ancestors had, had helped to create. And the 6th Massachusetts was one of the, comp one of the regiments that uh, was instrumental in keeping Maryland in the, in the Union. Maryland had been very um, uncertain whether they were going to become a secessionist, secede and join the Confederacy or stay in. Massachusetts played a vital role in keeping them in the Union. Uh, Massachusetts, not only because of this, um, this vested interest, there were other things going on here. Boston, in particular, was the was the um, sort of the center of abolitionist activity. Um, speakers, uh, abolitionists would come to places like Old South Meeting House, Faneuil Hall, the African Meeting House, and speak out against the horrors of slavery. And the people in Massachusetts, um, in these regiments, um, were very aware of what was happening here. Um, also, the uh, the attack on uh, on Senator. Um, uh, Sumner uh, on the floor of the Senate when he was attacked was actually almost a, a personal insult to the people of Massachusetts. So that sort of got people uh, sort of riled up. Um, when Lincoln was elected, he was elected under an anti-slavery uh, platform in November of 1860. Oops, I've got to remember to point it to this in this direction here. It's not working. There it goes. Um, and by the time of his, uh, his inauguration, um, seven states had already declared that they were going to secede from the Union. And after um, the events that I'm going to be talking about on April 19th and later, um, then we had four, four more seceded. And actually, one of them uh, seceded while the Massachusetts troops were on their way to defend the nation's capital. Um, we go to the next slide. Now, in January 1861, uh, Governor John Andrew uh, he became governor. He was sworn in at that point. He was a, a Republican, um, believed in Lincoln's platform, went, went, ran on the same type of platform. He replaced um, Governor Nathaniel um, Banks, who was a, a Democrat. Um, and he, Andrew quickly realized that there were the, what was happening. He recognized the rumblings that, this, that the nation was, uh, was in dire, uh, a dire situation. Uh, so, and he went to Washington to find out what was going on there. He talked to senators and representatives, um, and he quickly realized there were trouble. We needed to prepare for war. So he, uh, one of his executive orders as a, as a governor uh, was to prepare the, the, the militia. Um, he sent out an order saying that all the militia units need to be prepared to be able to go at a moment's notice. Your, your, the members of your militia uh, have to agree that they would be available to go. Uh, now, think about, at the time, the militias were more of a ceremonial thing. They weren't necessarily expected to be responding to these types of crises. Um, their, their main event of the year 
it was actually the, uh, the encampments where they would meet other regiments from the, st from the state, or their military balls, and there'd be um, big uh, write-ups about the, how festive they were looking in their uniforms at their, at their military balls. Um, when they, the focus of the militia changed over to now a wartime footing, uh, many of those who uh, were in, the, the old-timers, um, realized that they were, they were no longer welcome. They left. They had a co commitments and business or family, that type of thing. They wouldn't be able to keep up with the rigors of, of war, um, so they left. And new, younger people came in, um, and, pe and people like um, uh, Luther Ladd was 17 years old when he joined. 21-year-old uh, Addison Whitney, uh, these were from Lowell. Um, they, they joined the, the regiment, or the company in, uh, in Lowell. Um, this, the legislature also realized that this was a problem, too. They needed to, to beef up things, and they started uh, uh, um, authorizing expenditures of equipment so they could modernize the uniforms and the, and the weaponry that they had there. Um, and they, in January uh, tw 21st, the regiment met in Lowell, and they, um, they had a discussion on whether they would support what was going on here. And, um, they, and they, at the meeting, they unanimously decided that they were going to support what was going on, that they were going to, to answer the commitment um, if the governor should call on them. And that may seem like a, um, a, a sort of a, a routine thing that you would expect them to do, but many of the officers of the militia were appointed by the Democratic governor, and their loyalties would be more toward a Democratic focus uh, by committing themselves to the, um, to the new governor. Um, it, it, it sent a tremendous message that we're all in this together. Make sure I get the right here. Okay. On April 12th, the Fort Sumter was attacked, and, the, and three days later, uh, Abraham Lincoln called uh, for the, the remaining states in the Union to send 75,000 troops to the capital to protect the nation's capital. Um, at this point, Virginia and Maryland are still in the Union, and they're deciding whether they're going to send, send troops to, send to the nation's capital at this point, too. Uh, Ma Massachusetts quota in this was about 1,500 uh, men, and we qu they quickly mobilized. They, um, the four regiments were sent, the 3rd Massachusetts. Um, they left on a April 17th, arrived at Fort Monroe, which, by the way, has just become a national park site, um, and they arrived on April 20th. The 4th Massachusetts militia also left on the April 17th and arrived at Fort Monroe the same day. Uh, the 6th Massachusetts, which I'll talk about, and the 8th Massachusetts, which went down to Norfolk and was, uh, was instrumental in um, saving and rescuing the USS Constitution. Uh, the sailors had all left, and it had soldiers um, manning the, the, the ship as it was being brought out to, to try to save that. So, um, On April 15th, a, a telegram was sent to Colonel Jones, the commanding officer. This is Colonel Jones, the commanding officer of the 6th Massachusetts, ordering the regiment to Boston Common. Um, in the regimental history, um, uh, John Hanson, he was the chaplain, wrote, the Middlesex villages and farms then heard the pounding of hoofs and the alarm cry of danger, as in the olden time uh, they had listened to the midnight ride of Paul Revere. So you can see that they, they're still making that connection to, what, to the events that happened 86 years earlier. It was still fresh in, in Massachusetts memory. Uh, the following day, well, actually that same day, Lowell companies mustered in Lowell. They, were, they got together and they, they um, slept in the old town hall in Lowell. Um, and then the next day, Lawrence, Groton, and Acton companies also mustered at 9 o'clock in the morning in Lowell. Um, and then they arrived in Boston, they got on the trains and arrived in Boston um, at 1 o'clock. That day, the weather was nasty. It was, it was a sleeting rain, and these, these men um, had left their homes, some actually left their homes very hurriedly, just like the original alarm, um, leaving what they could. One guy actually still had muddied boots. He didn't even have a chance to go and change. He just grabbed his uniform and changed when he got to Boston. Um, and they marched to Faneuil Hall. We can see the Faneuil Hall right here. Um, three more companies were added to the regiment to bring it up to full strength. And then um, they, they, um, then they went to, to Boston Common, um, to muster together. And one soldier wrote, we have been quartered since our arrival uh, in the city at Faneuil Hall the, and the old cradle of liberty rocked to its foundation from the shouting patriotism of the gallant sixth. During all the heavy rain, the streets, windows, and housetops have been filled with enthusiastic spectators who loudly cheered our regiment. 
The city is completely filled with enthusiasm. Gray-haired old men, young boys, old women and young are alike wild with patriotism. Um, at this point, the, the, um, the, uh, the enthusiasm was so strong that one man from Boston, a man named Charles Taylor, uh, who's been referred to as a fancy painter, we don't know much about him, uh, quickly came forward and joined one of the regiments. Still in a civilian uniform, he was given a musket and, a, and an overcoat to make him look like he's part of the rest of the regiment. Um, nobody knows much about him, but he was, fell into the ranks with the rest of them in his, his excitement. Um, at 11 o'clock uh, on the 17th, they marched to the State House where they received their, their regimental flags and, these new, and the new muskets. They were given the most modern weapons of the time, the, the uh, Springfield, 1855, um, and they were their regimental flag. And, and to be handed your regimental flag was considered a tremendous honor that the governor now is bestowing upon them a responsibility. And they got their regimental flag and, and, and assembled. Um, oops, sorry about that. Oh, come on. Why isn't it going? What's going on here? <laughs> it's going to want to go back. I'm going the wrong direction, it looks like. Okay, there he is. Okay. Um, uh, before boarding the train, though, um, Sumner Needham um, wrote a, a quick note to his wife. And he, he, he realized when he, when he grabbed his uniform and went to meet with the regiment, his wife was very quiet, and, uh, and he could tell that she didn't approve of what he was going to do. Um, and so he wrote a letter. Uh, it says, my heart is full for you, and I hope you will meet, we will meet again. Um, I shall believe that we shall. You must hope for the best and be as cheerful as you can. The reason why she was so somber, why she was so quiet, um, she, and she, she, we, we believe is that she didn't say, she didn't tell her husband at that point she was two months pregnant. Um, so didn't want to burden him with that, so he went off to war thinking things were fine. About 9 p.m., they, um, they got on trains and they started traveling through, uh, uh, through the countryside toward New York City as their first destination. One soldier reported, um, the cheers upon cheers rent the air as we left Boston. At every station we passed, anxious multitudes were awaiting uh, to cheer us on our way. Um, and they, as they continued, they arrived um, on the 18th in New York City, uh, very early in the morning. Um, they were sent to the various hotels in New York City, uh, gave an assumptuous breakfast. Uh, they were uh, very well fed. Uh, marched down Broadway um, with flags fluttering and those type of things. Private Dennis of Worcester wrote, writes, their enthusiasm exceeds all bounds. Uh, they became so carried away with their handkerchiefs, gloves, pieces of ribbon, and even curls were cut from their heads and thrown down on the boys while the bands played the national airs and patriotic songs were sung. So you can see this, this whole sense of headiness, this tremendous idea of, of, of gallantry and, and pageantry and all these things. These men are really excited about what they're going to do. Little do they know what they're, what's waiting for them when they reach, which reaches Baltimore. Um, they, when they crossed the river into New Jersey, they crossed on the ferry. And this is where things start to change. The order of trains were set up specifically because they wanted to have Colonel Jones would be in the front of the train and his executive officer, second in charge, would be in the last train to be able to make sure the whole regiment moved together. When they switched over in the ferries, there was a mix-up and, and the executive officer, um, Major Watson's train, uh, was brought in sort of in the middle and he wasn't aware of the mix-up until later and it, and it causes some problems there. Um, as they neared Philadelphia, though, Colonel Jones was informed of, some, of, a, of a situation that happened in Baltimore um, that day on the 19th, on the 18th. Uh, Baltimore had a history of violence. It was once, uh, is often referred to at the time um, as, a, as a mob town. Um, they had uh, street gangs there known as the Pug Uglies, or there was the Bloody Tubs, uh, which caused all kinds of violence there. Uh, it was also a city in conflict itself. You had a very strong unionist, people who are pro-union, want to keep the union together, and a very strong presence of uh, these secessionists, those who want to secede. Uh, and so there's this, this, this thing going on back and forth that's causing a, a heavy tension. The, uh, the, on the 18th, uh, about a thousand troops from, from Pennsylvania had come through um, Baltimore. And when you get to Baltimore, the train, you get off of the train station, there's a city ordinance that, wouldn't allow, that does not allow you to take a train with an engine through the city to the next train station. They had to be pulled through the center of town using horse carts. And this, um, this regiment from, from um, Pennsylvania 
um, were unarmed. They had been turned in their weapons. They, were, they thought they were going to get someone. They got to Washington. They had no uniforms. They expected to be furnished that. So these are basically a 1,000 men hanging around on a train. And as they're being pulled through, um, there was a scuffle. There was a bit of an attack, mostly just broken windows and shouting and that type of thing. One person did get injured in, in that. It was a, a personal servant of one of the officers. Uh, and they were able to make it on toward Washington. They were really the first responders, the first ones to make it to Washington, but unarmed. So there's another 1,000 people sitting in Washington with no weapons itself. Um, so Colonel, Colonel Jones now is concerned, and he calls his men together, and he says that the, the regiment will march through Baltimore. Um, and he said, you will undoubtedly be insulted. He was giving them a warning of this. Um, abused and perhaps assaulted, to which you must pay no attention. Can you imagine what that must feel like for some of these guys? They have, they're going through, they're representing the United States government, and they're here on a, on a, a very noble mission to protect the capital, and they, they, they're going to have the city of people rough them up as they go through, which is what they expected, the similar situation to what happened to the Pennsylvanians. Um, and even if they throw stones or bricks or other missiles, um, but Jones added, if, you fire, if you're fired upon and any one of you is hit, your officers will order you to fire. Do not fire into promiscuous crowds, but select any man whom you, may, whom you may see aiming at you, and be sure you drop him. So he's giving them the orders now that this makes sure this is an, a very serious situation, and we are going to be disciplined soldiers as we march through, march through Baltimore. Um, a private, a private Ferber, a 20-year-old saddler from Lawrence, um, actually wrote, we, um, we feel confident there'll be no fighting, and we will be home again in less than three months. So he has a sort of head in the sky, think, still caught up in the pageantry. Well, they arrived in Baltimore early. They, they left Philadelphia very quickly at about 1 o'clock in the morning to be able to make it through. They got to, actually got into Baltimore around 11 o'clock before anybody knew they, what was happening. Um, they, uh, Colonel Jones fully expected his men to be marched across the, uh, to the next train station from President Street Station on the east side of, of Baltimore to about a mile, mile and a quarter uh, over to Camden's, Camden Yard where the, where the Orioles play now. Um, that's the Cam's, Camden Station to get on trains there and then move on. Um, when they arrived, um, the cars were quickly unhooked and they were, being, they, they were brought onto uh, um, horses and pulled, quickly pulled away, one after another, quickly pulling them away through there before the, the citizens of, of Baltimore could find out what's happening. And this surprised Jones. He expected the men to be marching. Um, they, uh, most, of the, most of the regiment was able to make it across. Uh, make sure I get... So I want to point out... Um, this is President Street Station, and this is the route that they're going to have to take here to Camden Station itself here. So, um, make sure I go to the next one. Oops, that way. Oh, man. You can tell I'm not used to this technology. Okay. There it is. Um, about, now, about noon, the car containing Major uh, Benjamin Watson, he was the executive, the second in charge, was being pulled about four blocks, and that's about where I put that red dot right at the top there, uh, right there. Um, about four blocks, as they're about to turn onto Pratt Street. That's the street that goes right along the, the, the whole front here. Um, they, uh, the, the, some of the people in Baltimore, some of the roughs, uh, ruffians had thrown some obstacles in the way to try to prevent them from, from moving on there. Those were being pulled away. Uh, they threw sand on there, and they started dragging anchors on, all these types of things. Um, Watson now is a little bit concerned, and as, they, as he, he able to get past there, um, his so soldiers, I mean, his soldiers are still in the cars. They're told to drop down below the window so nobody would see them and draw the curtains so nothing would happen. Um, and the, the, the men are getting anxious about this. They want to be able to retaliate. And at one point, the, um, along the way there, the, uh, the car jumps the tracks, um, and, and, and they, it's, it's, it's when they were able to get it back on there, it says as soon as they started pulling in there, it was almost like a signal for them to start, send the, for the, Boston, uh, the Baltimoreans to start throwing all kinds of missiles at them itself. Sh shattered windows. Um, at one point, he's telling his men to hold off, don't do anything, until one, he heard a shout in the car, a man raises his hand, and his, the guy's thumb had been blown off, so he orders his men, now is the time to fire. 64 men jump up from behind the, the, uh, the windows, open the windows, and fired into the crowd, um, trying to keep the, the, them back. And they continue to onward over here toward Howard Street, 
right, right over here, is there, there, there are more obstacles uh, block the, the way, and they have to get out of the, the, uh, out of the trains at that point and get it down to, to the next, um, down to the Camden station. Uh, jumps, heavy finger here. Okay. But at this point now, there's still four companies set back at, sitting back at President Street Station waiting for their turn to be dragged through here. Uh, two men, two unionists from Baltimore came up to, to Captain Follinsby, who is now in charge of the rest of the group here, and tells them that the train, the tracks have been torn up. You're going to have to walk. Um, not quite sure where, which way to go. Uh, Follinsby contacts a, a policeman that's in the area to get some directions, and he's able to do that. The men start forming up. And as they got only a, f a short way up here to Fawn Street, some a crowd of secessionists gather around. One man's holding a flag, the South Carolina Palmetto flag, and he plants it in the ground right in front of the, the troops there, almost dares them to cross. One unionist in the crowd sees what's happening, goes over and grabs the flag and tries to take off with it, the cr and the, the, uh, the secessionists beat him up, take the flag back, and now sort of as a, as a taunt, that same secessionist now starts marching in front of the soldiers with the flag on a pole itself, almost making it look like the Massachusetts troops are following behind the secessionists and in, in favor of secessionism. Uh, at one point, at this point, uh, one uh, lieutenant is fed up with the whole nonsense, breaks ranks, goes over there and grabs the flag and stuffs it into his shirt and then falls back into ranks. And now the crowd is really getting riled up at this point. Um, As they turn on toward, um, oh, at that point also, I, I, my mistake here. Uh, uh, as they're forming up there, Sumner Needham now has a change of heart. So, I mean, Sumner, yeah, Sumner Needham sees, he, he's concerned about the crowd gathering. And he turns to his friend, a private knight, and tells him, he says, he's a, he doesn't feel that he's going to survive the battle. If I survive what's going to happen here. And he, may, he makes him promise. He says, if I, if I don't make it, please make sure my body comes, goes home to Lawrence. Um, and uh, this knight was confused and told him that don't, don't worry about it. Little did he know that this, this is exactly what's going to happen. And as they, as they continue on, Toward, uh, as they're crossing over here, oops, so as they're crossing over toward onto, pra onto um, uh, Pratt Street itself, they're attacked once again over here. Uh, the, the crowd is gathering now, they're, they're firing at them, and these soldiers are, allowed, are well, according to one description, uh, George Booth, of, of a state militiaman from Baltimore, wrote, a, um, a soldier was struck by a stone, fell almost at my feet, and as he fell, dropped his musket, which was immediately seized by another person uh, there, who raised it to his shoulders and fired the first shots into the column. Uh, at this point now, the rear files turn around from the Massachusetts troops and fire into the crowd itself. They continue on. And this, uh, from, from here onward, there's, it's almost a, a, a gauntlet as they're fighting along here. In this section right here, Luther Ladd, is, as he's marching into the ranks, uh, and he's struck by a, a railroad tie that was thrown from the second story building, hits him in the back of the, of the head. He falls to the ground, the, and the crowd presses in, grabs his musket, fires into, the, into his groin. As he's being literally bleeding on the streets of Baltimore, uh, one, one person from Baltimore asks him, he says, why are you here? And, and Luther Ladd says, I'm here because of the stars and stripes. He's letting them know that he's a, a pro-unionist at this point. A short while later, a set, the next casualty takes place, and, that's over, uh, and that, that was uh, Addison Whitney. He was, he was shot. Uh, they continued marching on toward. Okay, whoops. And this is Luther Ladd and Addison Whitley as they're marching along. Um, and they get to Hanover Street at this point. They, have, they, it, they make it the last uh, 200 yards down to Camden, the Camden Street itself. Now, most of the men are there. Um, Colonel Jones now is concerned that his, um, he thinks he has the, has the entire regiment. Little does he know that sitting just a short distance away, back in, at, at the um, President Street Station, the regimental band, 24 members unarmed, are still sitting there with, and behind them in the cars behind are 1,200 Pennsylvania troops, also unarmed. The crowd in the, in the Baltimore realizes that they're, that they're still soldiers in the area, and they descend on them. One description shows that the, these, for the, uh, the band members as they're 
sitting in these converted cattle cars, so to speak. Um, as the crowd descends on them, it was like in a horror movie, as, they, as they're trying to force open the, the doors, they're kind of trying to climb in through the windows, any way they can get in there. Uh, the, the band members are forced to run out the back way, running through the streets, stripping off anything that identified them as, as uh, soldiers. Um, at one point, they're running down the street, and there's a woman, a very large woman, is standing in the doorway, and she's t telling them, come in this way to the doorway. And one description says it was a German woman. Actually, she was a... Um, a, a madam. She she ran a, a very a prosperous brothel in uh, in um, in Baltimore, and she was she got them quickly up to the second floor and gave them a change of clothes and then helped them escape, make it back, uh, make it back through to Philadelphia. So she was able to help help them make their escape. Now the train pulls out. The at this point, the train is pulling needs to pull out. That's shown there. Um, and, they, and later in the afternoon, um, the, the troops finally make it to Washington, D.C. And as they're unloading their train, um, the, some of the soldiers recognize uh, two women from Massachusetts. And Dorothea, um, I mean, I'm sorry, Cl um, Clara Barton um, is in the crowd. Some of these soldiers actually had her as a teacher. Uh, and they, they were yelling to her, waving to her. And she was actually, when she saw that there's so many wounded, um, she, at that point she's realizing she needs to do something. So um, she goes home and, and, and sets up a plan which she ends up helping out um, with a, um, a, as a sort of a nurse um, during the Civil War itself. And they was, the soldiers were, were sent to the Capitol building. They were sent to the um, Senate chamber there to, uh, for, to, 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 to just to be able to rest and recover. Uh, gen um, the president came down to meet them. And um, the, the, the situation in Washington at that time was so dire they were concerned. Virginia had now seceded. Maryland is, on the, is tinkering on the verge of secession. What are they going to do? He actually he comes in there. He's so, he's so frantic because these are the first fully equipped, fully armed troops to make it into Washington. And he, sa and he says, I don't believe there is a north. You are my only northern re reality. So he's so grateful that Massachusetts troops are there. Um, the, as the soldiers are in the Senate chambers, they're going around looking at all the desks there. And, they, and according to one report, says they wrote letters at the desks of the honorable gentlemen, meaning the men from the South who seceded, uh, who had practiced treason and fraud at the government's expense. So um, they, they took this opportunity. Uh, a few days, days later, first Rhode Island volunteers arrive, uh, and then the 7th New York militia arrives. Um, and so they, they, the situation is now beefed up there. Um, uh, only a, a few weeks after, a few weeks after this, um, President Lincoln realizes that Maryland is in, in the verge of, of secession. He needs to do something. He sends the Mass Massachusetts troops into the countryside to, and suspends habeas corpus, starts arresting all the secessionists as best they can. Um, they, um, the 6th Massachusetts was sent, where else but back to Baltimore. If I can get that to work. Um, and they were sent outside, just outside of Baltimore. At first, they're sent out to, a, to protect the railroad. This area right here is a viaduct. Beautiful. It's still in existence here. To protect that there and their relay house. And then on, on May 13th, um, 1861, Sorry, there it is. Uh, May 13th, in the cover of darkness in a, in a thunderstorm, they, the 6th Massachusetts arrives back into Baltimore. And they quickly go up to Federal Hill, just on, uh, um, just on the inner, inner harbor, and they set up cannon. And in the early morning hour, it's sort of reminiscent of what happened at Dorchester Heights. Um, the, as the people of Baltimore wake up, they are now faced with cannon facing toward the city. And the, and the 6th Massachusetts quickly went into, into Baltimore and started arresting those who felt were responsible for the attacks earlier and any secessionists. The mayor, the police chief, and many others were arrested at this point. Um, so they were, um, and, it, and because of these arrests now, this, they, when these Mass the Maryland Assembly finally met, um, they, were, they voted to stay into the Union. The secessionists were kept, kept out. So it was exactly 86 years uh, before Massachusetts militiamen first shed blood uh, in the struggle to form a new nation. Ironically, that anniversary, Massachusetts militiamen once again shed blood, but this time in defense of a nation that their grandparents struggled to, to create. So Massachusetts was instrumental in preserving the Union of, uh, um, in, in, because of Baltimore. Does anybody have any questions? Feel free to ask. Wait, um, if you have any questions, please just wait for the microphone because we'd love to get all of your questions on, uh, on video. Okay. Sorry. Well, I have, <coughs> excuse me, I have two questions. One is that you didn't mention 
General ben Benjamin Butler, I and I thought he was in charge of Benjamin Butler is in charge of the brigade of four regiments that are going through there. Um, it's, it was a little bit outside of my story. I only had a half an hour. But um, Benjamin Butler is instrumental in, in helping there, too, because his other regiments are going around protecting. Um, uh, actually, early on, they're, they're uh, repairing bridges and railroad lines that have been bro broken down. Um, he um, is in the, in the countryside, basically pr keeping lines of communication open. Um, and, it, and he was one of the one. He's, he was in charge of the third, the fourth, the sixth, and the eighth Massachusetts, the brigade that was sent down there. So um, later on, he does. He goes on to other great things. And or well, what was he doing during all this? He, he attached himself to some of the other regiments. He didn't. He wasn't with the sixth at that time. He attached himself, I think, with the, either the third or fourth regiment. He was attached to them. His headquarters was near more near them, and orchestrating these all of these. Um, um, the, the actions of, this, of the other militia companies. The other question is, what sh what's the source of all your information? I used, um, oh man, I used so many, so many. I used um, original documents. The, may the mayor wrote a book, uh, Mayor of Baltimore wrote a book about his actions, uh, of what happened because he was accused of, of causing problems. I read the official police reports. I read the, um, the uh, after-action reports by Colonel Jones uh, and secondary sources. Um, I've read. Uh, um, there's a new book on the, a new book called the, uh, the Siege of Washington, excellent book, and another one called Dissonance, which is about the first few weeks of the of the war, and um, and of course uh, O'Connor's book on uh, Boston and the Civil War. <clears throat> He, he, I didn't, I didn't use any of his original sources. I was trying to get the, the because the battle, and I and probably didn't go, do as well as I should have, but the battle is a very confusing, uh, in Baltimore, it's a very confusing time of what's, and what's happening because these are guys who are coming through with the idea that they were, this was all pageantry, this was all show, we're gonna, this is gonna be over real quick. And the, 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 the quick change from this pageantry to absolute horror of warfare um, happens in such a short span of a mile distance is what happens where these men are suddenly transformed into now combat veterans. Um, I, I was trying to get that part of it more than trying to do the bigger picture. I could have done the bigger picture, but I was just trying to focus on the 6th Massachusetts <clears throat> at that point. So Yes. yes. Uh, can you tell us whether the 5th Militia was engaged in any other battles during the Civil War? Oh, the 5th War, but I don't know, know, know much about them. They were, they were, um, these are all three-month regiments. These are all three-month regiments. So by the end of August, all of these regiments are returned back to Boston. So um, the 3rd and 4th, 6th uh, and 8th were part of this brigade. The 5th goes on later. I think they leave um, in June. I think that they are the ones that leave out in, in June, and I'm not sure exactly where their area of operation was located, so... Two yes. quick questions. Is sure. the uh, the man at the bottom there the uh, the one whose yeah. wife was pregnant? Yes. And what's his name? That's Sum Sumner Needham. Uh, he was 32 years old. He oh. worked in the mills in Lawrence. And uh, yeah, you didn't mention when he was killed. <coughs> Probably, oh, excuse me. The second he was time. the first of all. He's referred to as the first casualty of the war, um, uh, first by hostile action. Um, with him, uh, at very early on, just around where, where President Street and Pratt Street meet, um, a, a paving brick was thrown at him, and it hit him in the front of the skull. And actually, I do have a vivid description of that, and I didn't. I decided not to use it. Okay. Uh, but it did it hit him in the, fr in the front of his skull. He lingered for a few days, um, and they actually did some, um, tried, to, tried to relieve the pressure. It's called trepanning, where they actually use mm -hmm. a primitive tool to drill in the head um, to try to relieve the pressure, and it didn't work. Was he, he Needham didn't named after him the town? No, not that I know no. of. No. My other question, I live in Attleboro yep. on Railroad Avenue, okay. and there is a plaque near there saying that and I'm wondering, is were they in the 6th Regiment that they uh, lined up and, and went to the Civil War from yeah, that? Yeah, I'm not sure. The 6th six, the were mostly from Middlesex and Essex County, this one from Bristol. Worcester and one from, Sto well, there was Stoneham, Acton, Groton, uh, Lawrence, Lowell, and Worcester, I think, in oh, Boston, one regiment from Boston. Attleboro's south yeah. of that. Yeah. Okay, I'll so, have to yep. examine it myself. Yep.
Uh, just a question about the kind of the logistics of choosing Massachusetts regiments to go there because it, it would just seem that it would be easier to send a New York or Pennsylvania regiment first. Was it because they were more prepared, more zealous because yeah, Governor they, Andrew? Yes, that, that's what it was. Um, Massachusetts was ready. I mean, um, Governor Andrew had got the wheels of, of, of in motion early on. From the, in January, he's talking about war and he has them moving ahead modernizing their drill, their, I mean, getting rid of all the old men that who aren't going to be able to do a good job here, um, getting a younger crew, um, giving them more modern weapons and everything like this. He's getting them all ready to go. So that they, and he wanted them to be ready, just like the ancestors before, to be ready at a minute's notice, to be the Minutemen of Massachusetts, Minutemen of 61. That's the, 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 the term that they, that the, these four regiments actually adopted as their own as the Minutemen of 61. So the first defenders is the Pennsylvania troops. They use that term, the first defenders. Um, but the, the Massachusetts was the Minutemen. They were ready at a moment's notice. The call came out on the 16th. They were there ready in the, I mean, on the 15th, they were ready on the 16th, the next day. Ready to move, and they were gone the next day after that. So. Just a quick, I, I've heard that some of, some of the first burials from that regiment were at King's Chapel. Have you heard anything yes, about they, that? Yes, they had the memorial service for, the, for all of the victims. There were four people that were killed. Um, three of them, they recovered the bodies. Uh, Charles Taylor, the civilian, not in uniform, um, they assumed he was one of the, the civilian casualties. There were, there were um, 40 people uh, injured, um, uh, yeah, 12 killed and 40 injured in the, in the, the, um, for Baltimore. And um, they thought he might have been one of them. They had been trying, over, over the years, they had been trying to identify where he was buried. They never did find his body. But they did have memorial services here for the three victims. And then they were sent out to, um, they, the two were sent to Lowell. And then the families recovered them there and moved them out to their hometowns, one in Alexandria, um, New Hampshire. Another one was in Maine. Uh, and then the, the Lowell asked if the bodies could come back. They created a memorial for them in Lowell. Um, Sumner Needham was brought to Lawrence. And there's a memorial for him in Lawrence. Thank you. The, uh, were most of the militia members from Lowell and Lawrence, were they from the mills or were yes, they? Yes, for the most part. Um, mo for the most part, like I said, I started my research doing it from my hometown, which is Methuen next door. And um, some of them worked in the mills, some of them were farmers. I mean, it, it was a mix. But the Lowell and Lawrence companies tended to be from the mills. Uh, Luther Ladd, I think, was a, um, was a millwright um, at 17. He was a, a millwright. And the other one was a weaver. Um, Addison Whitney, I think, worked in the uh, Middlesex weaving room. He was a weaver in the, in the weaving room. I, I think that maybe by this time the, the Boston owners were already hoarding cotton and reducing employment in the mills. Right. Was that any factor in all of this recruitment? I, I don't know. Um, Lowell actually had a mix of, la of, of wool and uh, cotton, so they could have easily converted over. Um, Lawrence was mostly cotton, but they, they could do wool also. Um, there, this part, at this point, there's no, there's no blockade. I mean, the, the, the South still needs to sell their stuff. They still need to sell the cotton, because how are they going to finance their government? They need to sell, sell them, and, they, and there was arrangements made when, they, when the rumblings of war were coming. There were arrangements made beforehand to make sure the stuff could be shipped. So they, they, they had already set this, this pipeline in motion for the supplies to be able to come up there. This early in the war, the mills are still fairly active and not too much of a layoff going on. Later in the war, as the blockade takes effect, then they're going to be, they're starting to choke them. They're starting to choke the mills and the, and the south, so. Thank you. Um, you said that they first were in the capital, and this group, and then they were sent back to Baltimore? Yes, or did yes. They? Once, as more and more troops started arriving in the capital, the, the Massachusetts troops were no longer right. needed to be there, so they so sent they them sent out. Them. To the, and most of, the, most of the, the, the ones that were sent to the countryside were to protect communications with railroads and with uh, telegraph lines because those were being sabotaged. After the, after the Massachusetts troops leave Baltimore, the, uh, the people in Maryland, the secessionists, are going around and they're, they're burning bridges and they're cutting telephone lines, and, I mean telegraph lines, and they're trying to get rid of all communications into Washington, isolate Washington as much as possible. So they're set, quickly sent, and the Thomas uh, Aqueduct, if you, I mean a viaduct that you saw, um, that's an engineering marvel. It's still in existence. It's a beautiful, beautiful structure. I've been out there. And that junction has, is the, the trains goes from two lanes to one, one track. One track goes to Washington, the other one to Harper's Ferry. So it's an important, vital link to the rest of the countryside. Um, so they needed to protect that. And, they, and they, when they left there to go into, into Baltimore to arrest everybody, um, they, they, other units were sent over there too, So they were, as they were constantly filling in. Uh, it's interesting, though, that they were there 
um, at, at the Relay House when um, Colonel Ellsworth, that's the guy on the top with the, from the 7th Massachusetts, uh, 7th New York, was actually um, a well-respected colonel. He had been killed um, by a secessionist in Alexandria, Virginia as he was pulling down the secessionist flag and he was killed there. And they, as the train is leaving um, Washington to bring him back to New York, the men lined the tracks and gave him an honorary salute as, he was, as the body was being brought back to New York. So. I had a great grandfather who fought from Lawrence okay. in the Civil War. I got to talk to you afterwards. And I then. knew absolutely <laughs> nothing about him except he had come from Scotland and he fought. I may have in the, the Civil information War. you need then. And right here. When I went to the <laughs> cemetery in yeah. in Lawrence, yeah. they had a special section of the cemetery yeah. and special ledger right. from people. Who only people who had fought in the Civil War were there. Alive there are two sections. There, there. there were two GAR units, uh, two Grand Army of the Republic uh, organizations in Lawrence, and they had their own sections in there. So I'm actually we, my group goes there every Memorial Day, and we're going to be there um, on Veterans Day for memorial services too. So in uniform to come. One more that, question so. over sure. here. Dan. I'll be around afterwards if anyone has any questions too. So I I have a question on what made them such ardent. Uh, anti-secession people, or somebody out there preaching at them? That, that I don't know. Um, I, maybe, maybe the, I, I can't say that they were all ardent anti-secessionists, but many of them were. Um, because of their, this connection, they, they, they recognized that the United States is very fragile at this point. It's only 86 years old. I mean, that's a life, only a lifetime, one lifetime. They knew people who actually served in the revolution. Um, in, you know, so they, they had that, that connection, a very strong connection to that. Um, there were some um, that probably didn't care. Some actually, those who worked in the mills, probably thought, you know, we don't care about slavery. It's not the issue of slavery because that's supplying them with cheap labor, uh, cheap materials so they can get their jobs going on there too. Um, but there was a lot of, there were, in the North, there were lots of newspapers out there. There was a lot of um, uh, uh, anti-slavery anti newspapers that were based out of Boston and out of New York that were being circulated. And also, it's this, this is the country. I mean, it's, this is their, the, the stars and stripes. This is a, uh, something to be proud of. That patriotic spirit was still very strong in them. And I want to point out that that's a good point, because in the South, when they secede, they're seceding for the same reasons. They believe that our United States government now is in, in violation of the, what was agreed upon early on, and that they and that they and actually there is one um, there is one picture here that I point out because this is actually not a more this right here is not a modern I mean a, a, um, a, a northern propaganda piece. This is actually a southern propaganda piece. The Lexington of '61. They're trying to refer themselves what happened at Baltimore as what happened at Lexington, and that the good guys are the ones here and the bad guys. What does this remind you of? The Boston Massacre picture, and that's exactly what their intention was on this one here. This is actually a Southern propaganda piece. Well, the other question sure. was, you had so many slides and you tantalizingly I know. passed them all. Why? I, well, because I was running short on time. This is my first time doing this, and I put too much, I overprepared. <laughs> so well, I had too many things. I mean, but I'm willing to show you afterwards if you'd like. I can show you whatever I have there. So, okay. yes. Wait, Kath, wait, microphone. Okay. I just wondered when did they stop um, doing, or did they ever stop doing three months? Uh, yes, almost immediately. Um, after, after the first, first Manassas and they realize that this isn't going to be over in three months, um, they start, they, they change it. The next regiments that are being recruited are three-year uh, three regiments. And many of the guys who served in the 6th went on to, f to serve in other units. And um, they served either in the 1st Massachusetts Heavy Artillery um, or they served with the 26th Massachusetts. Colonel Jones was also the, um, the commanding officer of the 26th. Uh, the 26th ended up serving in the Gulf and, and also in New North Carolina, if I remember correctly. So. Wasn't Uncle Tom's... Well, hold on, let it, let's get... It's, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, wasn't that written by uh, someone... Harriet Beecher Stowe, uh, Massachusetts. I mean, yes, yep. we really got the, the whole thing going here in Massachusetts, right. largely because of Uncle Tom's Cabin. You have, and you have two issues going on. There's the anti-slavery issue going on there, but in this case, it's the patriot, the, the patriotic the secessionist. To the north, secessionism is not a, a um, 
to, is not an option. Um, the Constitution says that you are part of this great union and you don't have the option now of, of going, leaving because you've made this agreement. To the South, it's always thought of the Constitution as a loose agreement that they could do, that the state still had primary. Primacy. And, and you'll still see those same arguments being made today. I, you can listen to the politicians today, the same, same things are being argued today. And if you look geographically, it's almost in the same geographic areas.